This is not actually about Cabrillo. It's about what it means to name something, to, uh, to honor the places where we work and research and teach and dream and hopefully build future generations that are far more able to center a world that values justice and climate resiliency and a history that doesn't disempower the voices of our most marginalized peoples. Welcome to Talk of the Bay. I'm Christine Barrington. Most residents of this region are well aware of the Cabrillo College name change process, which unfortunately has become quite divisive and controversial. While some have welcomed the process, there has also been much discussion of the costs involved, disagreement over the potential new name, and rancor over how the process has been engaged. It sometimes seems that the core reason impelling the name change fails to get centered enough in the conversation. The grievous harms perpetrated on indigenous tribes of the American continent in the name of colonization is embedded in the widespread naming of both physical landmarks and institutions after the colonizing perpetrators of violence. In spring of 2021, a community name exploration education series was presented to the Cabrillo Board, as well as the wider community via Zoom, and it is available for viewing on YouTube. The April 8th session was particularly potent. It featured Native leaders and educators and was entitled The Impacts of Colonization on Native Americans. Because this impact of colonization is a central motivating factor in the renaming process that is happening across the United States right now, it seemed beneficial to allow these indigenous voices to speak again over the community airwaves. And so for Talk of the Bay tonight, I am playing excerpts from the April 8th presentation, which featured Canyon Coyote Woman Sayers Roods of Indian Canyon, Dr. Kutcha Risling Baldi of Humboldt State, and Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez. I include a link to the entire presentation in the show notes, which can be found at ksqd.org. We now start with words from Matt Wetstein, president of Cabrillo College, introducing the speakers. All of the panelists who are presenting their information tonight uh, please keep in mind that we seek to bring important historical perspectives to you, to the discussion of the college's name. You and I may, may find that we agree with a lot of what they say, and we may also disagree, but all of us, I, I would say, would benefit from learning various new viewpoints about history, and particularly the history of our region and California. So that's our hope to expand people's minds tonight and increase knowledge about the history of our region. So we have several great distinguished speakers here with us tonight. I wanna to do introductions of them and then we'll turn it over to them. First is Canyon Sayers Roots, who is the CEO of Canyon Consulting. Canyon is a member of the Mutsun Ohlone Chumash tribes and goes by her given name of Coyote Woman. She's proud of her heritage and her native name and is very active in the native community. She is an artist, poet, a published author, activist, student, and teacher. Her art has been featured at the De Young Museum, uh, the Silmarts Gallery, Gathering Tribes, uh, in Snag Magazine, and numerous powwows and indigenous gatherings. She's a recent graduate of the Art Institute of California, obtaining her associate and her bachelor of science degrees in web design and interactive media. Canyon's the daughter of a well-known Ohlone native elder, Anne Marie Sayers, who is featured in the recent documentary, In the Land of My Ancestors. Uh, Canyon's gonna provide a land acknowledgement statement and some other comments um, before we launch into our other two panelists who I want to introduce as well. So without any further ado, it was a real pleasure for me to introduce Canyon Sayers Ruins to open up the discussion and our presentations tonight. Mishmin Tuhis, thank you so very much for that amazing introduction. I am honored to share space with these amazing beings. I am so happy to be here. Mishmin Tuhis, Countercott Canyon, Coyote Woman Sayers Ruins. I come from Indian Canyon Nation. 
the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along central coastal California. That being said, being the daughter of a tribal chairwoman, I recognize my privilege. Being raised on the land of my ancestors, where my grandmothers, grandmothers, grandmothers have always been from, and to be raised where culture sharing is a day-to-day -day activity and interaction that I was able to be raised in and honor. Indigenous protocol, or today we sometimes call it land acknowledgements, is a way that we might be able to acknowledge the land that we are on in today's post-colonial settler environment. Indigenous protocol is a way that we can acknowledge truth in history about the original stewards of the land that we are on and that we benefit from. And so having been raised on the land of my ancestors, my mother, my grandmother, being of a matrilineal society, we have always believed that when song, ceremony, and dancing stops, so does the earth. I very much believe that. And so I want to offer a grandmother song. This grandmother song came to me differently than it was taught. I identify as a Mutsun Ohlone and Chumash activist, artist, and consultant. And this is a grandmother song that came to me differently than my mentor taught. Because whenever I sing that grandmother song with my mentor, that it is only meant to be sung with that person and in those spaces. This song came to me differently than it was taught, and therefore it is able to be shared intertribally, intercommunally, and to the community. It is to honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and in all Mother Earth, for without them and without her, we would not be here. We share this time and space together for a reason. So it's with that humility, that gratitude, that present mindedness that I offer this song here to this space. And I will use my regalia as an instrument because indigenous peoples don't wear costumes. This is my medicine. So this is Canyon's Chumash Grandmother song. My, my, oh, acknowledge that we are in community together it helps us be united so i find it so very important that we honor truth in history that we take the time to consider how we came to be here together why are things the way they are part of that is just acknowledging indigenous protocol by becoming familiar with the indigenous peoples and the histories of these spaces and places because I honestly believe that when we honor indigenous pedagogies and acknowledging indigenous protocol, when we honor the past to shape the future, we can strategize sustainable futures. And that means we need to look at history thoroughly. We cannot bypass, we cannot sweep it under the rug. We need to bring everything to light and then consider it. Honor the past to shape the future is not just highlighting the beautiful, wonderful sparks of occurrences, it's integrally listening and understanding how we got to where we got to. Because in all honesty, did you know 1978 was the first time the indigenous people in the Americas had the right to practice their religion freely? 
1978 Indian Freedom of Religion Act. I have to share this because just because I'm an indigenous person doesn't mean like I got a zap of knowledge that all of a sudden just informed me of all of these truths, these truths and atrocious crimes against indigenous peoples and against humanity and for that matter. And I have to share this. My native name is Coyote Woman and I will be that rambunctious, wily coyote offering the conversations of the in-between. That's what inspired me to start my business because many organizations and government agencies don't like to talk to individuals. So how do tribes and communities get their perspectives shared? We have to play their game. So I started Canyon Consulting LLC to bridge the gap between indigenous and contemporary value systems. At the same time, I'm anti-capitalist, I'm flipping everything. And so my coyote nature will put me in these positions. So I understand there might be things that will be said here that some people may feel uncomfortable with. Feel it, listen to it. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations because in all honesty, I am not okay with that introduction that I heard about the name change, that publicized piece of media. All of my relatives who tried to watch it could not consume that media either. That has to be said at this moment in time. If we want to honor truth in history, listen to the community, hear us, and it's going to be uncomfortable. And we're not going to get it right the first or second time. But part of it is hearing us, being compassionate, and recognizing that we all don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot that we can learn. But when we come together and when we honor truth in history, we could take steps to honoring all of our ancestors. When we honor our ancestors and their ancestors, all of us have ancestors that are indigenous to the land that they come from. Meaning we could all honor our indigeneity. And part of that is acknowledging indigenous protocol. If you are not on the homeland of your ancestors, you should consider how you are being a good guest and how you are honoring truth and history with where it is that you stand. So please hear these amazing beings. I am so humbled and honored to be in this space. I am happy <laughs> to offer an acknowledgement. And I encourage you, check out nativeland.ca because you can say every meeting you go to from here on out, you can say, I'm calling in. Right now, I will let you know where I'm at. I am calling in from Mutsun Ohlone territory. And even when I visit far away, I will always say where I'm at whenever I'm part of these meetings. And you can find out where you're at too by going to native-land.ca. So I wanna say thank you to everyone. I'm honored to be here. And we're gonna hear some amazing elements of perspective, conversation, and it might be a little uncomfortable, but we gotta hear it. So welcome everyone. Welcome to Occupied Ohlone Territory. Honor, truth, and history. You are listening to KSQD on 89.5 FM in Monterey, 89.7 Prunedale, and 90.7 Santa Cruz. This is Talk of the Bay, and we are hearing excerpts from the Cabrillo College Community Name Exploration Education Series. This presentation from April 8, 2021 is entitled The Impacts of Colonization on Native Americans, and it informed the name change process, and we hope it adds to a context of understanding for the current community conversation. We'll be back with more after this short break. Hi, I'm Bobby Bishop, host of Be In The Night, bringing you the best I can with jazz, love songs, and soul. Join me on Tuesday evenings from 7 to 10 p.m., playing the classics straight ahead and introducing you to the latest artists and composers. That's Tuesday nights from 7 to 10 p.m. right here on listener-supported KSQD 90.7 FM, Santa Cruz. Our next segment features Kutcha Risling Baldy from Humboldt State. The content of Dr. Baldy's comments contains sensitive historical accounts of a provocative and brutal nature. Parents may wish to take care. Dr. Kutcha Rissling Baldy is an assistant professor and department chair of Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. Her research is focused on indigenous feminisms, Californian Indians, and decolonization. Her book, titled We Are Dancing for You, 
Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies is available through all major booksellers. And she received her PhD in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in feminist theory and research from UC Davis. And she also has an MFA in Creative Writing and Literary Research from San Diego State University and a bachelor's in psychology from Stanford University. Dr. Rissling Baldi is a Hoopa Yurok at Kauruk and an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very humbled and honored by the opening and the space allowed to have an opening that I think really, truly um, respects Native protocols and how we introduce ourselves, how we get to know each other and build relationships. I'll start with my introduction for you all. Uh, hey, young Kilek Kutcher Rizling Baldia Holyet. I'm Dr. Kutcher Rizling Baldi. I'm Hoopa York and Karuk and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley tribe. And I just noticed earlier that my mom and dad are actually logged in on here. So my mom and dad are here listening right now. My dad is Steve Baldi and my mom is Lois Rizling. And if you ever, if after this speech, you're like, I wonder where she learned all that. Well, they're here. They're right here listening. And um, I was actually talking to my mom about this talk last night on the phone and some of the things that I had planned to say. So I'm glad that she's here with us today. Uh, I kind of wanted to approach this in two directions, and I'm going to try to do this in my short 20 minutes, right? The first is to talk a little bit about Cabrillo, right? Like Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. And for me, when I was thinking about like how I wanted to approach this, I don't think that this is a moment to actually investigate or even put on trial Cabrillo the man. Uh, I choose not to center Cabrillo in this endeavor because who is Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo? I mean, really, do we wake up in the morning and think something like, well, thank goodness Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo discovered this bay because who knows what I'd be doing, what I'd be making my coffee if Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo hadn't done what he had done, right? I don't think we actually think about him on a fairly regular basis. Uh, we can lay out like facts and archival documents about who he is. But in the end, it really doesn't matter who Cabrillo is because we're not talking about Cabrillo the man, we're talking about Cabrillo the name, the representation, uh, the colonization that happens through naming and the importance of renaming. This is not actually about Cabrillo, it's about what it means to name something, to, uh, to honor the places where we work and research and teach and dream and hopefully build future generations that are far more able to center a world that values justice and climate resiliency and a history that doesn't disempower the voices of our most marginalized peoples. We know that naming is important. It's the reason why uh, we don't just go willy nilly around renaming things all the time. You know that moment where native people are like, hey, change the name. And then someone's always like, it's just a name. Uh, my response to that is like, you're right, it's just a name, so change it. Uh, we know naming is important and that it means something, that there is a value to how we name things and who we center and who is represented, which is why we get uncomfortable when people start talking about renaming. What would it mean though to wake up and have markers and monuments and buildings and roads that are named for the most marginalized among us? What if we were surrounded by indigenous languages and indigenous place names and indigenous faces? In my region, we have a sacred island for the Wiat peoples. For many years, it became known as Indian Island. This was because a group of Humboldt County citizens came one night and tried to massacre all the Wiat women and children and elders who were sleeping there. Last year, the city of Eureka returned the island to the Wiat this is their sacred center of the world. And after 150 years, it came back. And now we make an effort to call it Tuluat, not Indian Island, not Gunther's Island, which is what it was named after this guy Gunther tried to steal it from the Wiat who were forced to run away. But Tuluat, a place of world renewal for everyone. I don't really care about Cabrillo the man. It was we who elevated his status when we put a bunch of monuments up and we're like, yeah, Cabrillo. Uh, I actually think of this tweet I saw one time where someone was like, all these people say constantly, don't worry, history will judge whoever it is that we're supposed to be judging eventually. 
who did something bad. And yet we don't even judge the colonizing genocidal slaveholders who sex traffic native girls, mostly children, and then participated in this system, the mission system that then starved native people and forced them to build missions while whipping them with various objects. We still say things like, isn't he just a man of his time? I hate the man of his time argument, by the way, because it's very shallow. Every man in every time had many other men and women and gender non-conforming people who thought that that guy was a jerk and were horrified by what was happening at that time. Name me a time and I can find you at least one person who was saying, somebody stop this, this is bad. You know who always knew that there was a problem at that time? Native people. We always had the opinion of that time that that guy was not a good guy of the time. For Cabrillo, if you need not Native people to tell you he wasn't a cool dude, you can point to people like Bartolome de las Casas, who wrote things like, quote, with my own eyes, I saw Spaniards cut off the nose and ears of Indians, male and female, without provocation, merely because it pleased them to do it. Likewise, I saw how they summoned the chief rulers to come, assuring them safety. And when they peacefully came, they were taken captive and burned. Or even another quote, they took infants from their mother's breasts, snatching them by the legs and pitching them headfirst against the crags or snatched them by the arms and threw them into the rivers, roaring with laughter and saying as the babies fell into the water, boil there, you offspring of the devil. Cabrillo was known at a point for joining forces with Hernan Cortez in Mexico and enslaving native people, putting men to work in the mines for gold and forcing them to build his ships and then sending the women and girls to his soldiers for sex slavery. He invaded cities throughout Central America, then made his expeditions up into what is currently called California, and one day fell out of his boat, cut open his shin because a group of Tongva people were attacking his soldiers and then died of gangrene. He was basically just a rich dude in his time who sailed some places. None of his place names actually stuck because people of his time didn't really pay attention to what he was doing. It wasn't until 1913 when President Woodrow Wilson proclamated the construction of a quote, heroic statue of Cabrillo. By 1926, the order became defunct because nobody did anything about it. And President Calvin Coolidge was like, Somebody build a monument. And he told the native sons of the Golden West to do it, but then they didn't do it either because they couldn't get their act together. So finally in 1939, the Portuguese government commissioned a statue and donated it to the United States. And then we got the Cabrillo National Monument. And then Cabrillo College was founded in 1959. Now I digress because I don't wanna get lost in reinterpreting these Western archives to discuss Cabrillo the man or Cabrillo the historical figure. These archives were written to silence Native people by documenting really our death and our enslavement with words like labor and punishment. I don't want to get into the weeds about if we were meant to parse words over things like rape, when one of the very first things that Father Junipero Serra documented in his writings was the rape of women and children by Spanish soldiers. It's unfortunate that not enough people know about what happened with Spanish conquest or what colonization truly means. We honor the colonizers, not because they deserve it. People of their time didn't even think they deserved it. Columbus, for instance, was like kind of a joke to people of his time. That guy thought he was in India. They knew he was the joke. So we honor the colonizers today because we are meant to internalize these logics of settler colonialism to justify the ongoing dispossession of land, life, history, and sovereignty of indigenous peoples. The name is meant to disregard the historical fact that violence and genocide is what it took to build the state of California. We have to learn to justify logics like manifest destiny and heteropatriarchy and terra nullius and the doctrine of discovery. I often tell my students that this idea, this discovery idea, that somehow it's important or possible to like discover a place where millions of people already live and that somehow discovery is binding and legal and real. We have to learn that because it's the basis for most of our federal law.
We have enshrined in our legal system that if you are a Christian colonizing nation, you can discover a non-Christian nation and claim it as your own. We inherited this from the British, which we should all find hilarious because we are taught as young American citizens that we reject everything British and the British way of doing things. We wrote a mean letter to the king and we were like, we declare independence and we will never be like you ever, except we claim to be the discovering nation of native peoples in this region, even though we aren't, because it would have actually been the British or the Spanish. So basically we have no discovery street cred, but we embrace it like we do. That's what naming's about. The naming from American presidents honoring discoverers of this continent is about ongoing dispossession. They came here and they tried to rename our lands, to remove our memory from this place and to end us. They started with renaming. It was clear to them that they had to name it to claim it. We had already named everything. Kat Anderson points out in her book, Tending the Wild, that in California, there was no wilderness because every place already had a name. California Indians had named every place. They asked us, what's this place? And we told them, this is the land that made us. This is the water that nourishes us. We call it relative. And they stripped it and mined it and destroyed it and spilled our blood upon it and then erased us from the texts, the songs, the street names, the map markers, the monuments that were erected to pretend like this history was justified. We can name a university after anybody or anything that we want. Why do we want to honor our colonization, dispossession and genocide? Whether or not Cabrillo was a kind of okay dude, the naming of a university after him is not to honor him as a person, but instead, it is to honor him and name a university after a Spanish colonizer and what he did to support ongoing colonization and dispossession. Okay, second, sometimes when I'm in the archives, I will read a short line or scribble made by some white guy discoverer who with flippancy and shallowness will write about the Indians or, or Los Indígenas. Columbus wrote, in his writings about a woman he raped once and how she scratched at him and fought him off so he had to tie her up with a rope so tightly that she cried quote unheard of cries that's what he said he wrote about her unheard of and then he added quote it seemed she had studied at a school for whores this indian woman who fought him off who cried out, this Indian woman who Columbus said he amused himself with. Junipero Serra wrote in 1778, quote, the soldiers clever as they were at lassoing cows and mules would catch an Indian woman with their lassos to become prey for their unbridled lust. At times, some Indian men would try to defend their wives only to be shot down with bullets. And he ended with, quote, even the children who came to the mission were not safe from their baseness. I read these things, I live these words in my body, and then I think about my daughter. I think about what I would have done if they tried to rip her, rip her from my arms and take her from me. What I would have done if I heard those cries and how we would have cried for her. See, because we're people, we're human beings. And I cannot pretend like those cries don't travel through time in an archive full of words that were meant to discuss us and dismiss us like we were less than human and a history that's written even now by people who would say these were men of their time or they were just doing what they were told or they were just soldiers. What it means that we held each other at night and prayed for the future, that we breathed in the scent of our babies and our young ones and wondered how we would survive. I remind myself, like I'm reminding you here, that we are and have always been human beings, that we likely begged for the lives of our children, that we loved each other and hoped and ran and fought and cried and sang and danced. And even with all of that, we are still here. I sometimes don't know if I would have been able to survive it. 
But I know that there were those of us that did, who carried forward stories and songs and jokes and visions and prayers and knowledges. And that's what I wanna honor. Not the story of a colonizing regime, not monuments to attempted conquering of us, not fantasy stories about discovery, but the love that survived and carried us forward. This place had a name before Cabrillo. That name was built with us. It was called out and it has survived. And why wouldn't we want to honor that name? The name of this place that for so long before was filled with love and laughter and hope for the future. The name of this place that knows a time before this colonization and that helps us to envision what this future will be like long after this colonization is done. So I want to end here. In case you don't know her, this is Toy Perina, a Tongva medicine woman who led a revolt against the mission San Gabriel uh, on October 25th, 1785. Uh, as a result of her revolt, she was exiled to the mission Carmel and she died in Mission San Juan Bautista at age 39. The revolt was very important. It was an example of Indian people uh, pushing back against a system that was trying to destroy them. It demonstrates that as they were working through this change in their world, they resisted, they fought, and they did it even if they thought it meant that it felt impossible because I think they needed to make sure that we had some of these stories to tell. Now, a lot of people don't know about Toy Perina, which I think is really unfortunate to know that she's a medicine person who led a revolt. But those of us who know, those indigenous peoples that carry on this story, we never let her be forgotten. And we demonstrate for people how important it is that her voice is carried forward. I think about this when I think about our young people, about how they go into a school system that devalues their histories. They are surrounded by monuments and names of places that devalue their histories. And we push back with our own monuments, our own murals, our own renaming. And we remind our young people that they should be empowered by history, not feel dejected and sidelined which is what history does right now. Now, in 2015, they declared Junipero Serra, the father of the Spanish mission system, a saint. And as California Indians tried to reconcile what this would mean, that somehow a man that was responsible for the attempted genocide of so many indigenous peoples, the enslavement, the destruction of land, and of course, the removal of native peoples from their regions, that somehow he would be a saint. What was really important is that at this time, as Sarah was declared saint, somebody, and I don't know who, went around and started to post street signs over any sign that was named Sarah Way, Sarah Street, Sarah Avenue, and replaced it with Toy Perina. To be able to see that, to be able to feel that, what it meant, that our people were being named as the true people that we should be honoring, the people that we should know about. And I wanna leave you with that as a vision of what we can do and why that's so important. Now in Hupa, what we say at the end of a story is Hayanantik. That means like, it's done, that's it, it's over. But what it also means is it reaches so far. I ask that you take the things that you heard today and take them to the next place. Uh, let it reach as far as it can possibly go and think about how it affects you as you move forward in this world. So we'll end by saying set dia. Uh, that means thank you. You are listening to KSQD on 89.5, 89.7, and 90.7 FM. This is Talk of the Bay, and we are listening to excerpts from the Cabrillo College Community Name Exploration Education Series. This presentation from April 8, 2021, is entitled The Impacts of Colonization on Native Americans, and it informed the name change process, 
we are hoping it adds to a context of understanding for the current community conversation. This next segment features the work of Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez. Because of time constraints, portions of his presentation were excluded. We encourage listeners to follow the YouTube link in our show notes at ksqd.org for Dr. Rizzo Martinez's entire presentation. Our third speaker tonight is Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez, who I'm proud to say is a former Cabrillo College student uh, who received his PhD from the History Department at UC Santa Cruz in 2016. And he's currently the California State Park Historian of the Santa Cruz District. His research and writings explore the history of indigenous people of the Santa Cruz area, and he works closely and collaboratively with the Ama Mutsen and other mission surviving families. He's published multiple articles on this topic, and his first book about local indigenous history is scheduled for publication later this year with University of Nebraska Press titled, We Are Not Animals, Indigenous Politics of Resistance, Rebellion, and Reconstitution in 19th Century California. Thank you so much. Um, you. Yeah, it truly is an honor to be here and uh, especially to share the floor with uh, two of my heroes, uh, both Kenny and Kutcher, are, are just phenomenal people. So uh, that was very powerful. would like to say a couple of things really quickly uh, about Toy Purina. I think um, it's really amazing that uh, she was brought up in that story. I think people don't realize, but uh, she actually had three children who she died when they were very young. Um, but they grew up in Santa Cruz. They lived at the Via de Branson Forte. And there's, uh, anyway, very fascinating stories of the, her daughters in particular. Her son died when he was young. And I believe that there are descendants today of Toy Perina uh, and of those, the two daughters there. Just thought I would mention that. Well, first of all, I, I want to follow what Kenny was uh, suggesting as well and, and point out that I'm talking to you all uh, from the city of Soquel, uh, which is on Oipi lands and the Awaswa speaking Ohlone, Ohlone tribe, the Oipi. Uh, who are the ancestral relatives to today's Mutsun people. That includes the Ama Mutsun and other Mutsun families like that of Canyons. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that as well. But I also uh, do not plan on uh, talking uh, about Cabrillo, other than to say that, uh, you know, uh, Cabrillo was somebody who passed by this area uh, in a boat once. He didn't even stop and get off the boat. And so that's the extent of uh, what I'd like to talk about Cabrillo. Uh, but instead, I would like to talk to you all about local indigenous history, uh, about names, about erasure. This here, this map that I'm showing you here is a map that was originally uh, produced by uh, Ed Ketchum, who's the Amundsen tribal historian. Uh, I worked with him on this and uh, made some adjustments to some of the areas in the Waswas area, which is uh, this area that we're here in Santa Cruz. But I want to uh, start with this because I want to give you a sense of things. And I want to point out that, you know, that everything already had names. All of these lands here, all of the mountains, all the rivers, all of these villages, all the people uh, had longstanding names uh, for many, many years, thousands of years before this process of colonialism. Um, but the process of colonialism is a process of renaming. It's a process of imposing names it's, uh, and also erasing names by this process as well and erasing histories. Mountain ranges that we know of today as the Santa Cruz Mountain Range uh, were known by the people as the Maxareja. Uh, and then the mountain range that's known as the Diablo Range uh, is over here was known as the uh, Sha Choka. I want to draw attention to the Diablo Range in particular. I think that you'll notice throughout the state of California, there are many things that are named Diablo, including in the Bay Area, uh, a Mount Diablo, which is a very high mountain that's a very central point. Well, uh, the history of the Diablo Mountain, for example, uh, obviously was not called that. The Chechenyo people called it uh, Tuishtak. It was called Oyempile by the Sierra Miwok. This is a mountain that tribes from all different areas would come. Their spiritual leaders would come to this, men and women. They would gather to have ceremony. Um, part of the reason when you see things that are named Diablo, uh, usually the reason for this is because the Spanish would label places where spiritual leaders went to uh, as being of the devil, right? And so these names stick, it becomes the Diablo, and it's, uh, you know, usually that's a good indication that it is a place of spiritual significance uh, for the people in the tribes that were here before the Spanish. And this particular place is one of the places where uh, the people practice the Kuxui uh, ceremony, which is a very important ceremony, a very important deity. Uh, and in the Spanish records, they talk about uh, seeing the, you know, being afraid of the Kuxui, who they leveled as the devil, as a Diablo. So uh, these types of names are there for a reason, right? And if we trace them back, you can understand this process of colonialism. 
Uh, for those who don't know, you might notice a, a familiar name here, Aptos. You know, those who live in this area or attended Cabrillo College, you know that it's in a town that is called Aptos. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that Aptos was actually the name of the people of this area. Uh, people don't really recognize it today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Aptos and give you a little bit of history about them in particular. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to talk about some other local names uh, and kind of go over, introduce uh, a couple of these things. In the local languages, uh, there's different uh, Ohlone dialects. The Mutsun and the Waswas were the closest ones, the Rumsun to the south. But in all the local dialects, the suffix here of ta or tak, uh, or sometimes rook, it means a place of, or the home of. Uh, and so some of these names are things that are out there in the records, uh, but we don't use them today. Uh, Santa Cruz was known as Alintak, uh, which was, translates uh, here, as you see, to the place of the rab Red Abalone. Alintak was a village that was in kind of near downtown Santa Cruz, near like where the boardwalk is today, in that hill right there. Uh, it was part of this village center. Another place, uh, Watsonville, was called uh, Tiuvtak, which means place of the elk. Now, some people might have heard the story of Portola, the Portola expedition. When Portola came through their infamous expedition in 1769, they passed through, they, they uh, ran into people at this village of Tiuta. This is where uh, the village had left. They were in the middle of a condor ceremony, which is uh, sending messages to the dead, uh, as condor does. And they had erected a stuffed bird there. And this bird, uh, of course, is the reason that we call it Pajaro Valley, right? The Spanish called it, uh, they recognized this bird, this giant bird, uh, and they, they decided to call, we still call it Pajaro Valley from that. Uh, of course, the place is actually called Tiuftak. Uh, and in those, if you read the expedition notes, they actually ran into a bunch of elk uh, right in the area. But of course, they didn't recognize that this was the place of the elk, partly because even though they were both, both the Spanish and the indigenous peoples here were inhabiting the same physical space, they were in two different worlds, right? And this is that colonial uh, difference, right? This colonial imposition of a Spanish world that they're bringing with them and ignoring and erasing the indigenous world, which is very much there and alive um, underneath this. So uh, moving on, a couple of other names. Hollister was known as Cotretac, uh, which is a place of the gopher snake. Uh, Fremont Peak, I'm going to mention Fremont a little bit later. Fremont, uh, just briefly, was... Uh, an American general who was known for massacring women and children. Uh, we celebrate him. We call it City of Fremont. Um, the peak over, overlooks uh, where Cabrillo College is. If you go inland, it's right, the highest mountain peak back there. Uh, it's called Fremont Peak, but it had a name. It was called Toyotak, uh, which is the place of the bumblebees. The Monterey Bay itself had a name, which is Kalandaruk, um, which means ocean homes, right? And then Santa Cruz, bringing it back or to Cabrillo, uh, in the town of Aptos, was a village called Cayastaca. We don't exactly know the translation on it. Um, my, my guess on it, I could be wrong on this, is uh, these ones are more established from the oral histories, um, but it does seem to correspond to a word for jackrabbit. It's possible that that means a place of jackrabbit. Um, right here where we are, of course, is in Aptos uh, territory. We live in California where everywhere around us are these Spanish names, right? Santa Cruz, um, all, all up and down the states. Um, but of course, these names, everything already had names, right? These, these indigenous names already existed. They're already, you know, here. They're just, they've been hidden, right, through this process of colonialism. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Aptos people uh, and what time we have here to introduce. I think uh, a lot of people don't really know much about the Aptos people, um, but they were a large tribe in this area. There was, as I mentioned before, one of the large villages was called Cayastaca. Uh, there's two main groups of them. Um, there's about 183 people, Aptos people who are baptized in Mission Santa Cruz. And like I said, with the imposition of names onto places, uh, the same thing happened with tribes. The Aptos tribe, the, the missionaries uh, renamed them. They started calling them the San Lucas. Uh, they started calling people by different tribes and villages uh, according to saints' names. Uh, the Cayastaca villagers they call San Antonio. The Oipi tribe that lived just uh, north in the Santa Cruz area they call San Daniel. Uh, the same process of, of imposing of uh, you know imposing a Spanish uh, values. Of course, this is uh, Catholic Franciscan ideas, right? So they're imposing these saints' names uh, onto people. Um, this is this is how it was. Uh, the Aptos people had uh, in the oral histories they talk about uh, a little bit of a conflict between uh, the the chief of the Aptos, which is a fellow named Molenius. 
Uh, actually, I write here the head family, and I, I want to point out real quick that they they always recognize the male chiefs. But we know the indigenous peoples around here uh, also had female leaders as well, and so uh, we have to take this with a grain of salt sometimes when we look at this and understand that uh, it may very well been that the uh, the wife was actually the leader, right? But the Spanish, with their patriarchal lens, they didn't see this, right? They were they were again invisible. They erased this uh, matrilineal you know pattern within. Uh, native people or custom right so they renamed again when they would baptize people they would give them spanish names uh and so they they renamed Melenius as balthazar and salu his wife as anna uh, and like i said there was a, a little bit of a conflict between uh the aptos and the Uipi people um and the leader of the Uipi was a fellow named sokel and again i point this out because this is another name that many people in santa cruz area know sokel it's the big boulevard that runs through here it's a town where i'm living um you know these uh these names do are here but people don't recognize this sokel was uh the leader of the Uipi people along with his wife ross Wem. And they were, when the Spanish arrived here and they built a mission, they actually gave Sokel uh, a couple of cattle and a couple of birds in exchange for founding the mission on his territory. And this is another pattern of colonialism where the Spanish would select certain leaders that they privileged that they wanted to work with and they would exacerbate existing tensions, right? And they would uh, draw these tensions between different peoples by giving uh, certain things. This is a very old colonial process that goes back uh, to early Spanish colonialism. Another quick thing, uh, I don't have enough time to get into everything about the Aptos people, but uh, like so many things in the mission, uh, the conditions were so miserable, and I'm going to talk about that more in depth shortly here. Um, but in 1804, a measles epidemic came through, and the conditions of the missions were uh, so ripe for diseases and death because of these really poor conditions that about a quarter of the Aptos people who were living in the mission uh, in 1804 died uh, at that time. Uh, here's another map for you. Uh, this is one that I've been working on. Um, uh, right now in a project in collaboration with Canyon uh, and with the Alma Mutsen, uh, we're trying to develop a new plaque for uh, Mission Plaza. And this is a map we've been working on uh, to show what you see here is these are the tribes that eventually ended up at Mission Santa Cruz. And let me go back on that word. When I say ended up here, let me be more transparent about this. The process of missionization was, uh, this is something that scholars debate, uh, you know, in the very early years, there is an element of people coming to the missions to find out what's going there. But very quickly, this turned into a, a militaristic uh, situation. And certainly by the time uh, you can see here, Mission Santa Cruz is right here in Oipi territories. Very quickly, the, the different peoples here ends up to being about 35 different tribal, tribal or villages who end up uh, at Mission Santa Cruz, all the way reaching into San Joaquin Valley here, into Yokut's territory, into Mutsun territory over here. Process. Uh, was a militaristic one, right? Uh, there are letters uh, from the Padres who talk about celebrating, uh, oh, you know, we wiped out a whole village. We brought every last one, even the crippled people um, back with us. What a joy. All these souls are saved, right? Uh, we left some dead. Uh, these, you know, they're, it's very transparent. It's in the archives. It's right there for everyone to see that this process uh, was a very destructive process. Let me talk a little bit more about this. Uh, I want to focus when uh, I had some friends who, uh, the Tatavian family that was mentioned earlier, who traveled from mission to mission in 2015 in protest of Sarah, and they asked me to uh, do a little research and to look into uh, the number of baptisms and burials at each mission site as they went from mission to mission. Um, and so I, I compiled this chart out of that as I went through each of these. Um, I want to give you a sense of this. What you're seeing on the, uh, the highlighted areas of Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista, uh, and this is in relation to the missions. What you're seeing on the far right is the is the death rates right so you're seeing um the percentage of people native people who are baptized at the mission and the percentage of native burials that are at the mission and this is a very brief period of time we're talking about uh santa cruz is founded in 1791 we're talking to uh, about 1835 so about a 45 year period and what you see at santa cruz is there was about an over a 90 percent death rate and, it, and i will acknowledge too that some of these numbers don't capture uh, so to speak, the the fugitives. There were fugitives, people who would leave the missions that we don't have records of, right? So these numbers are are likely a little bit low uh, as well, right? The numbers are, of people who are actually dying and impact from this uh, were higher on this. Mission San Juan Batista was over 85% of the people who went there died. Um, there is a debate in academia um, about what is the nature of the missions, right? People debate whether the missions were, uh, we could look at them as um, concentration camps or whether they should be seen as just work camps or whether they should be seen as prisons um, all of the, this you know academic debate about this 
Well, I want to point this out. I think it's important to look at these numbers and the impact of things, because while it is true, and I believe the other speaker talked a little bit, I am talking about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the purpose of the, the Spanish colonization was to make native people their laborers, their workforce, their slaves, pretty much, right? It's the comparable uh, analysis here. But, uh, and while that is true, right, it wasn't their incentive to kill people. When you look at these numbers, right, when you see 90, over 90% 90 of the people are dying, uh, at the mission, what you see is that there was no effort put into protecting and to helping people, right? The, and when the conditions end up being the same, right? When we look at like the numbers from Auschwitz, right? Uh, some of the worst concentration camps, the number is about 85% of the people who went into these camps died. So in effect, the end result, whatever the, the aims or the goals of the missionaries might've been, um, the end result is that people are dying on a number that we, the only other comparable thing we can think of is some of the worst concentration camps in Nazi Germany. So, you know, this this debate is an academic one, right? For the families who survived the missions, for the people who whose ancestors actually survived this, I mean, do you think that they care whether, you know, what kind of model you can map this up to? The trauma is is there, right? I mean, this is, this is a traumatic experience of devastating loss, uh, incredible loss for, for all of the tribes, all of the peoples who went through here. Um, the people survive who did survive, right? The families, the ancestors of of like our, our previous speakers here today. Uh, you know, these these ancestors they survived because of their ingenuity, because of their um, their fortitude, because of their resilience, because they endured and were able to uh, push past in in spite of. Uh, the situation given to them by the missionaries uh, and later by the Americans we'll talk about too. Uh, what you see on the far left here, uh, over 50%, 52.6% of the people who went, in, who were born at Mission Santa Cruz did not survive to the age of one, to one year old, right? Um, they died, you know, either at birth or right afterwards. That's over half of the children born there. Um, and then the next, uh, the next marker, right? I took it up to age five, right? So between age one and five, over a quarter, 27.7%. You put this together, right? You have almost 80% of the people born at the mission did not survive to the age of five. I mean, it's, it's unthinkable to imagine what it would be like to be in a situation like this, right? So let me um, say but a couple of brief words about the American period, because I think we've spoken a lot about the Spanish period, um, but I don't think people realize uh, in general that the American period was even worse. Um, in many ways, right? Like we talked about the Spanish did, even though so many people, 90% of the people are dying, it, it became even worse in the American period. The genocide became an official US policy. For those who haven't read Ben Madley's book, uh, An American Genocide, uh, it's a must read. Uh, there are actually a lot of other studies out there. Uh, it's not the first time it's talked about, but he did put it all together. Um, but millions of dollars were paid by US government for militias and for massacres, reimbursements for scalp bounties. Um, There's an act to protect Indians, it was called in 1850, and this basically legalized child indenture. So in theory, somebody, not in theory, actually, in, in actuality, people would kill the parents and they would take the children, put them in their homes and make them work. Uh, and this was perfectly legal. In fact, it, it was it was legal beyond the end of the uh, Civil War when people in California realized, oh, wait a minute, we have slavery here. Uh, we have to shift this, and they did. But that didn't mean that people were given freedom. They were still in these homes. Again, I mentioned uh, Fremont earlier. If people want to look it up later, in 1846 was the Sac Sacramento River Massacre. And this is the massacre I was referencing. He killed a couple hundred Wintu people, uh, who was mostly uh, women and children at the time. And it was a massacre. It wasn't a battle. There were no shots fired in the other direction. And this was uh, commonplace at the time. This is one of many things. And again, as a reminder, Fremont Peak does have a name, Toyotak, right? the place of the bumblebees. Towards the closing here, last few minutes. First of all, I do want to bring it up again. I did send this before, but uh, when we think of the kind of consecutive uh, waves of genocide that happened here in California, in Santa Cruz, um, I do want to remind people that when you hear native speakers, like you've heard earlier tonight with the two speakers before me, uh, speaking about things, I, I do think it's really important to recognize that the the history of genocide that people have endured, right? And the, the people who are here speaking today are here because their ancestors have endured this, because they have uh, fought hard over over the centuries to make it through to this point. And I think it's really important to acknowledge. I think that uh, I want to encourage people to go out and go support Native people more today, listen to Native people, uh, and start thinking about uh, who are the Native people, as Kenny pointed out with that app or anything else, Learn the history of where you are, of the people who were, who who lived and survived in this area and who endured.
this name change, I do think it's important for people to think about, um, you know, what is the value of having a name in something? Is this name here, is it teaching people history? Is it helping people to understand an area or a land or a history? Uh, or is it erasing this history, right? And the last thing I, I want to end on is, is bringing up a point, and I hear this often today, of we cannot change the past, right? Renaming of Cabrillo is is not going to change the past. This is absolutely true. The, you cannot change the past. But the thing about this is, A, this is not what we're talking about here in a situation like this. It's true that we cannot change the past, but it's also very important to recognize that we are very much still living with the legacies of colonialism and of genocide. These legacies are very much alive today. We're all living in the shadow of the atrocities of this history. We know the historical trauma. Now people are studying historical trauma and transgenerational traumas. These are things that stick around right, for all of us, right? We're all products of this history one way or the other. Until we uh, start engaging with this, this history, then we're not going to be able to move through it. And so the way to move forward through this is to heal, right? I mean, if we want to do that. And the way to heal is to look at the hard truths of history and the hard truths of colonialism. Uh, so while changing a name or changing something is not going to change the past, it's, it's really up to us today to decide how we choose to deal with these legacies and the choice is ours. We can choose to ignore and to justify them, as some do, uh, or we can choose to deal with them. And if we're going to choose to deal with them, that's going to require that we be honest about our history and we be honest uh, about the work that we need to do to make amends. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Tonight's show featured excerpts from the Cabrillo College Community Name Exploration Education Series. This presentation, called The Impacts of Colonization on Native Americans, featured Canyon Coyote Woman Sayers Roods of Indian Canyon, Dr. Kutcha Risling Baldy of Humboldt State, and Dr. Martin Rizzo Martinez. This presentation informed the decision of the Name Change Subcommittee and is offered as context to inform the current community conversation around the name change. I want to close this show with a quote from the writings of Dr. Daryl Babe Wilson, a native of the Pitt River Nation. When the eyes of my heart look into the eyes of your heart and see only good, then we can talk. May we look for the good in each other's hearts as we move forward with this name change process. This has been Talk of the Bay. I'm Christine Barrington on KSQD, community radio for the Central Coast.